And Jesus said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight, and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, Do not bother me. The door has already been locked, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, Even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish will give a snake instead of a fish. Or if the child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Well, how many of you all remember Dennis the Menace? Remember the old uh, comic strip that started back in the 50s or the TV show that was in the 50s and the 60s uh, or even the uh, movie I think that was in the 90s. But they all tell the same story. They tell of a a young boy, five or six year old, named Dennis and his next door neighbor, Mr. Wilson. Now, Dennis is a uh, a well-meaning but a bit mischievous boy and he's always out in uh, the yard or out over at Mr. Wilson's house trying to help him out with whatever project he's doing. But Mr. Wilson is the, uh, the prototype grumpy neighbor. He never wants Dennis to come help because usually when he comes help, it ends up being worse for him. And so he's kind of, the, again, the, the epitome of the, the grumpy neighbor that we imagine standing on his front porch, waving his fist at the kids, get off of my lawn. We think a lot about the way that these two interact as we read today's scripture passage. Today's scripture passage is about Mr. Wilson and grumpy neighbors. Actually, technically, it's about prayer, but I want you to think about Mr. Wilson and think about grumpy neighbors in the middle of this uh, kind of understanding of what this passage is all about. So it's the teaching from Jesus, and the the passage that I read has three different parts. Uh, The first one is a parable about Mr. Wilson, a parable about grumpy neighbors. Uh, Basically, the the story is this. Um, the, uh, the, the, The culture in which Jesus lived was one of hospitality, uh, and one of honor and shame. And so very clearly, when uh, there was ever a need for hospitality, it would be very uh, imperative for the uh, host to do their best to host others. Now the problem was, um, that we didn't, they didn't have cell phones, they didn't know exactly when these guests were showing up. And so in the parable that Jesus tells today, uh, somebody just shows up. A visitor comes to a a man's house, and it's imperative upon him to be a good host, to give him food, to lay out food, even if he shows up at midnight, to give him a place to eat and a place to stay. Problem is, he didn't have any bread. He didn't know he was coming. And so, this man goes and runs over to the next door neighbor to see if he could borrow some bread to lay out for this visitor. The problem is, the next door neighbor is Mr. Wilson. The next door neighbor is the grumpy neighbor that we can all imagine in our heads yelling, shaking his fist. He basically does that. He doesn't even come to the door. He doesn't open the door. He doesn't even get out of bed. He just stays in his bed and says, I'm not going to help you. Find your own bread. I'm in bed. My kids are in bed. You know, this sounds like a you problem, not a me problem. And this is where he would slam the door if he had even opened it. But he doesn't do any of that. He's, he's incredibly ungracious and unhospitable uh, and unhelpful. Uh, so then Jesus goes on and uh, teaches some about uh, prayer, uh, asking, seeking, knocking. We'll talk about that section here in a minute. And then he comes back to Mr. Wilson, back to the grumpy neighbor. Uh, now, technically, this is about um, a grumpy parent, uh, but we can still kind of think Mr. Wilson in the back of our minds to help understand this, this second part or this third part of the, the passage. So in this passage, uh, it's dinner time, and a child is ready to eat, and so this child very innocently asks uh, for some food, asks for some fish to eat. But it's Mr. Wilson, the grumpy neighbor, the grumpy parent that says, oh, you want a fish, huh? Well, how about instead of a fish, I give you a snake? 
and puts a snake on the child's plate and puts it in front of the child. Um, oh, and then the child says, well, uh, could I have a, an egg? And again, the grumpy parent looks at him and says, I bet you'd like an egg. Wouldn't you like an egg? How about a scorpion instead? Right? Now, we're appalled by these pictures. Uh, it's like, how, what parent would ever do that? Uh, why would this neighbor be so uh, unhospitable? Why, why would that even happen? But the reality is Jesus is teaching us something. Um, and Jesus is teaching us about God and the way that we look at God. And it feels ridiculous, right? It feels like, well, that's, that's Mr. Wilson times like a thousand. Nobody would ever be that grumpy. Nobody would be that horrible. But the reality is uh, there's a question of what exactly is being taught here. Is Jesus teaching about a God that sees, kind of like Mr. Wilson, a shaking of the fist? Is there a, a question in some folks' minds of whether or not God is like Mr. Wilson? God is the grumpy neighbor shaking his fist from heaven saying, get off my lawn. Now you and I would say, of course that's not God. That's not the God we worship. That's not the God we talk about in Sunday school. But deep down, is there ever a time in which you wonder, in which you fear that maybe God isn't the God we talk about in Sunday school. And are there times where you wonder, does God even hear? We talk about asking, we talk about seeking, we talk about knocking. There are times in which we seem like we do those things. We pray to God for those things. And we don't get the answer that we seek. Again and again and again, we pray. Again and again and again, we have to wonder, am I even at the right door? <laughs> and then we hear the things that we are loath to hear. Those things that we think, once again, break our heart. It's cancer. She's gone. Dear sir and or madam, thank you for your application, but we've decided to go in a different direction. I think it's time that we see other people. There's been another shooting, this time in a church. And deep down we wonder, we fear, we're afraid that God is Mr. Wilson <laughs> That God isn't answering our prayers, but shaking his fist at us. Get off of my lawn. We ask until our, our voices become parched. We seek until our eyes become bloodshot. We knock until our knuckles bleed. And we say, can anyone hear me? It's this picture, this question that I think a lot of us face from time to time in our lives that Jesus speaks to. This is exactly the moment that Jesus speaks into. In, in, in the midst of our, our despair, in the midst of our anxiety, Jesus speaks a word of hope. Now, of course, Jesus is a masterful storyteller. We know that. But I think this is perhaps one of his more masterful lessons because what he does is he teaches basically at two different levels all at the same time. There are two different lessons happening at the same time in this passage. Uh, the first is, is a, what I call an even-if story or an even-if parable. You see these even-if parables a lot in the Gospels. It basically says, even if God were the worst possible deity you could imagine, so even if God were an unjust judge, even if God were a, a, a vindictive king, even if God were a, a, a grumpy neighbor, or even if God were a, a, a horrible parent, even if God were the worst deity you could possibly imagine, you would still have recourse. You still have recourse 
options. Basically, these even if parables talk about persistence, about endurance, to say even if God were this horrible deity, you could still, by persistence, get what you want. Eventually, the widow gets the, uh, uh, the judge to, to listen to her case. Eventually, this guy gets out of bed. It says, not because he's his friend, but because the guy is so annoying, he keeps knocking. We can imagine this even if kind of parable saying that even if God were this bad, we could still have persistence. And persistence is not nothing. Persistence matters. And as we continue to knock, as we continue to ask, as we continue to seek, eventually God will hear us. But that even if parable is not the end of the story, is it? Because we come here today because we don't believe that God is the worst possible deity. But instead we believe that God is a God of love. That God wants to give us good things. That God is a God of grace. That God is a God of, uh, of power and incarnation in the Holy Spirit. That God is a God of presence. And so we want to believe these things and we want to say these things. Uh, it's interesting the way that, that Matthew Skinner talks about this passage. He says that there's a, a reality that even in these even if parables, we want to see God in a very different way. And so he says, you cannot read this passage beginning in verse 5, as we did this morning. He said, you have to start in verse 1. For it's in verse 1 that the disciples came to Jesus and asked him, how should we pray? And Jesus teaches them the Lord's Prayer. Teaches them to pray, thy will be done, thy kingdom be come. Skinner says that's the way we have to start our prayer. He says this, he says, detached from Jesus' prayer, verses 5 to 13, might seem to offer empty promises, blithely suggesting that God dispenses favors and blessings like a vending machine. Christians should not pray to get whatever they want. They should pray for God to bring the fullness of God's reign to fruition. Thy will be done. Thy kingdom come. We can trust in God's will because God is not an unjust judge or a grumpy neighbor or an unfit parent. We can trust because God is a God of grace and a God of love and a God of care. And so the real good news in this passage is this. The grace comes in the knocking. For it is in the knocking that we find that we become changed. We don't come with a, our list of checklists of uh, things that God needs to do for us so that God can check them off for us. That's not the point of prayer. Instead, it is that God is willing to sit down beside us and make our list out too. To be in our midst, to be in the Holy Spirit, in the midst of our struggle, in the midst of our pain. When we are de devastated by the, the news of physical illness, the grace comes in the knocking. When we are afraid, afraid that when we walk into the church again, we don't know what weaponry, weaponry awaits us on the other side, the grace comes in the knocking. When we're concerned about, are we going to get that job? Are we going to make it to the next paycheck? The grace comes in the knocking as we knock, as we ask, as we seek. Jesus invites us, Continue and never stop. Because it is in that asking, it is in that seeking, it is in that knocking that the grace of God comes to us. The presence of God comes to us. Our fear is replaced by peace. Our questions are replaced by the very presence of the Spirit. Our anger is replaced by joy. And so Jesus teaches these two different things at the same time. He teaches, yes, absolutely, you must persist in the way that you pray, but absolutely, the good news, the fullness of the good news here is God's presence. That even if it looks like nobody's on the other end of the door, God is there. God is present, and the grace comes in the knocking.
you know, we uh, continue our series today, um, the second and three weeks, uh, about does church matter? This question of, well, why even bother? I mean, very often there, there you, could, you could look online for a preacher. You could, you could find so many things uh, in different places in our world. Why even come together into this place and gather in community and be here together? Does church matter? Of course, my answer is absolutely. Because here is where we find Together. Here is where together we can understand now the, a new way of seeing God, not as an angry judge, not as an angry, grumpy neighbor, but see God as a God of love and a God of peace, and we can talk and understand each other. Together we pray for one another. Together we come to each other and ask, look, how has God changed your hearts? Together we, we understand that the Holy Spirit is in our midst, changing lives, changing who we are, celebrating our stories, celebrating our joy. We do this together. And even in the pain, even in the, the fear, even in the anger that we face, even when we knock and we knock and we knock and we wonder until our, our knuckles bleed, it is in that moment that together somebody comes and brings our hand down. And says, let me knock for you for a while. That's what this place is for. This community, this together. And it's meaningful, I think, as Craig shared with us about Project 162, about the need to, to come together to, uh, uh, to continue to plan for the, the future. It's not uh, unimportant that this scripture passage is the passage that our prayer team for Project 162 chose to be the, the theme verse. To say this is what brings us together is prayer. Is coming together in the knocking. And I think it's important these days to remember why we started this in the first place. Remember our first capital campaign was called Building Hospitality. And now here we are living in a world where we wonder what that means. Can we be hospitable even if there are those who wish to harm us? Can we welcome the stranger if we don't know if we trust them? Can we build hospitality if we aren't? quite sure if we can handle the fear that comes with it. And so the prayer team has said very clearly, the prayer team has laid it out, ask and seek and knock for the grace comes in the knocking. There's power to understand that even in the midst of everything that is happening in our world, even in the fears that we have, that God is with us. That God is present. Now, today it may be helpful for you to know that we've had a, a team uh, meeting together for several meetings, several weeks now, uh, to talk about risk management, to talk about ways that we want to keep uh, this church safe. Uh, we've talked about active shooters. We've talked about um, keeping our children safe, child and youth protection. We've talked about financial security and financial safety. We've talked about a lot of different things, knowing that all of these different things uh, are risks in our world. Um, it's helpful to know that perhaps this conversation will help prepare us when whatever happens in our world. It's helpful that even in the midst of our fear, we read the news about a, a family dispute that turned violent in Texas. What could happen here? It may help you to know that we've been talking about that and talking about that balance between what hospitality looks like and what it means to keep our most vulnerable safe. Maybe it helps you to hear that. Maybe not. My guess is you didn't come to church this morning to hear a report from our risk management team. My guess is you came to church today because of Jesus. Because you wanted to hear about the one who is above and beyond that fear who is above and beyond our anger, who is above and beyond the questions that we have in our life, that there is one who loves us above and beyond. I guess is that you have come because you want to hear once again that story told that the grace of God is present, 
even in our knocking. Wednesday night was a a meaningful experience for me. Uh, Some of you have been a part of the two-way conversation on Wednesdays in which we get together and we we talk about the prior sermon and then we talk about the, uh, the scripture passage for the sermon that is to come. And in this uh, uh, experience, it's been a great opportunity to hear from a lot of different voices and just to, to dig in, to have some good, thoughtful conversation about the Scripture and kind of where it's leading. Um, but this last Wednesday night was a little bit different. We started talking about this question of, of knocking, of all the things in our life that we seek and we ask God for in prayer. And one of the uh, participants chose to be incredibly brave, incredibly vulnerable, and ask some hard questions. What if I can't see God? What if God isn't answering the questions that I desperately need answered? What if in the middle of my pain, in the middle of my agony, I don't even know if I have the right door? And so we paused We took a break from our uh, cognitive and intellectual discussions about the passage and we prayed. We prayed for this individual. We took turns knocking. Together we understood the importance of community, the importance of together. And it didn't fix everything in this person's life. It wasn't the the easy button. It wasn't a a vending machine that got everything answered right away. But I tell you what, it was a powerful experience of God's grace. It was a powerful experience of together. And my guess is it's not, not a surprise. You see that every week in your Sunday school classes, in their small groups, sitting around the table on Wednesday nights. These are the things that we do here. This is what together looks like here. Because we serve a God who loves us, a God of grace and a God of healing. Because we know deep down, even in the midst of our pain, even in the midst of our agony, that the grace comes in the knocking. May it be so. Let us pray. God, you who taught us the power of persistence and the power of presence. You who looked your disciples in the eye and said, do not be afraid. You who invited us to ask and to seek and to knock because you knew the power of that friendship with God. Thank you for hearing us today. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for loving us today. May we remember once again that we are not alone. In your name we pray. Amen.